Hey, good afternoon. How is everybody doing? Is the lunch good? Cool. My name is Igor Minar. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Google, and I lead the engineering team that works on Angular. Um, this puts me in a unique position where not only I get to work with very incredible engineers on the Angular team, but I also meet lots of engineers outside of Google um, that work with Angular, but also inside of Google that work on Angular applications. And when we often discuss things, we discuss things related to Angular, but we also discuss things related to software engineering in general. So when I was invited to come to talk to this uh, conference, I thought that it would be interesting to give a presentation on software engineering uh, and practices that I see working or not working uh, across the teams that I meet with. When I started preparing for the presentation, I kind of looked up the formal definition of what software engineering is. And this is what I found on, on Wikipedia, um, where software engineering is defined as development and maintenance of software in a systemic method, or using a systemic method. This is not quite how I would describe software engineering. And I think when we would talk about software engineering, we'd often talk about, like, yeah, we take some APIs, we write some code, use a bunch of tools, put everything together, and we have software. Ta-da! Um, sometimes it works really well. Sometimes it doesn't work so well. Um, and especially when we compare this, this approach to engineering to other engineering disciplines, like material engineering or electrical engineering, so civil engineering, we find that Approaches in these other uh, engineering disciplines are much more rigorous, and then they, they use a very different uh, way of, of thinking about this problem. So maybe there is things that we can learn from these other engineering disciplines. Um, but when also when, when contrasting software engineering with other disciplines, I realized that there is one thing that makes software engineering very different from, from these other engineering disciplines, which is the thing we built can't be seen or touched. Basically, what we are building is the invisible. And yes, there are some user interfaces, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of code that powers the user, interface, the user interfaces that we can't see. And when building this thing that is invisible, we are rarely alone. We have colleagues, we have teammates uh, that are helping us build this invisible thing with us. And this is very challenging because we don't have a thing that all of us see. We need to clearly communicate our goals. We need to understand uh, our assumptions. And only then we can be successful in building this invisible thing together. So what I put together is um, several areas of, of um, practices that I think would help us to build this invisible thing together. Starting with uh, assuring engineering quality, we'll also take a look at um, how we can make engineering more rep reproducible. And lastly, we'll take a look at how to bring quantification or how to quantify engineering effort. Assuring engineering, um, engineering quality is at the very basis because it's the fundamental, fundamental thing that allows us to build software. We often talk about this as implemented through automated testing. We've been talking about in, uh, automated testing for many years. Um, and for me and many, team, many people at, at Google, Automated testing is the enabler. The way we think about it, it's the thing that allows us to iterate on, on our code, bring more features, make risky refactorings, make aggressive uh, performance optimizations, all while knowing that all of the features that we built already still work. This allows us to ship product into uh, production confidently. However, when I talk to some teams, I still feel like there's a resistance to automated testing. And I hear arguments like, we don't need tests, uh, it takes too much time, it's too hard. Let me quickly address these. Yes, you might not need tests if you're building prototypes, demos, or if your project is a throwaway project. If you're building anything else that usually takes longer time, or you're building uh, this software with a team of uh, people, or you expect that there's going to be future maintenance, you will greatly benefit from having an automated testing. That brings us to solving the, it takes too much time to build a test suite or, or have an automated testing solution. Well, compared to what? It takes too much compared to what? Um, on any serious project, most of the time is actually spent in maintaining stuff, debugging, uh, and covering the cost of shipped bugs. If we start uh, with the test automation, we can greatly prevent this cost. So basically, automated testing will, will pay for itself very quickly. The last thing, 
some of the and some of the people argue that testing is hard. Well, we actually made it quite easy. If you use Angular CLI, um, it comes with scaffolding that set up, sets up your project. Uh, you have a Karma and Project to set up for your testing. The way it looks is you just generate a project using NGNU. You run ng test to start your unit testing um, setup, or you, uh, you run ng e to e to run your end to end testing uh, with Protractor. There is nothing else you, can, you need to do to get started. And when you want to, want to learn about how to write good tests, you can go to our testing guide where there's a walkthrough of how to write tests, what you can learn, um, and how to write good tests. So that covers the basic foundation. Once we have this, now we know that we can iterate in our project and we can move on. The next area um, where there are good practices to be picked up is area in making engineering more reproducible. And this is usually done through controlling variables. When we are engineering, um, the whole process is basically taking input in forms of, of source code and some dependencies, running through some build process and producing output. If for given input, we always get the same output, then our process is reproducible. If, however, over time, especially over time, this is a problem when, when we're building something over time, if the output changes without us changing the input, then we don't have a deterministic setup. We don't have something that we can reproduce on. This becomes very problematic and can cause chaos, in, especially in more complex projects. The common problems are things like um, developers claiming that the, the code works on their machine, but it doesn't work in production. Probably everybody knows this one. Um, situations where the code suddenly breaks without us changing anything, and we don't understand what changed. Like, how is it possible that this thing that we haven't changed worked yesterday and doesn't today? And lastly, it worked fine yesterday. We made a bunch of changes that looked innocent, and now they don't change. They, it doesn't work anymore, but we don't understand why. So what can we do to address these, these common problems? Uh, let, let's take a look at the first one. The problem usually is that you have uh, some times to local environment that, as, that is not part of the, the source control system. Basically, you have dependencies that nobody knows about. The, the way how you can mitigate this problem is using continuous integration. Once you have continuous integration, you move the source of truth about your project from local environment to shared uh, CI. Once you have that, then you have an environment that can be considered the golden copy, the, the place where all the testing happens, if tests are passing. This is an environment from which you should ship stuff to production, whether it's uh, NPM or, or deploying stuff to production servers. There are many solutions that you can employ. Um, we even have a guide that helps you set up uh, CI with uh, CLI projects. It just takes a few steps, and it can take a lot of headaches out of your uh, workflow. Let's take the second one, which is more serious. Uh, and more, more common these days. We haven't changed anything, and yet uh, a build is read, application is not working. Why? I was reminded of this just last week when I was debugging this problem. So n not even, no, nobody's perfect. Like We all have this problem, and we have to keep this in mind, and, and with every change, we need to make sure that this, uh, this kind of practices hold true and, and we abide to them. The, usually, the, the reason why things break unexpectedly is that we don't have hermetic build and test setup. What this means is that we don't have full control over variables. Um, these variables come from many, many different sources. The most important ones are dependencies, our build process, and the network. Let's take a look at what I mean by dependencies. The most obvious one that usually you think about right away is um, the NPM dependencies. Angular itself, TypeScript, many other tools that we use are shipped through NPM. Um, and this is how we depend, um, how, this is how we re fetch these dependencies, these packages, and build our, our projects. Um, in the past, it was very uncommon that projects used something called log file. Log file is a manifest that specifies not only your direct dependencies, but also indirect dependencies, and a particular version of these dependencies that is used to build a project. Um, this is something that was introduced uh, when Yarn, uh, an NPM client, came out. And in the recent version of uh, NPM version 5, they added log file support out of the box. So log files are these files and manifests that you commit into your source repository, and they have a full description of all of the dependencies and particular versions uh, that should be used. This makes installing these dependencies deterministic and reproducible across all of the environments. It greatly helps to reduce problems. The next source of, of dependencies that we often don't think about is we use NPM to install dependencies 
but who installs NPM and what version? This is something we should also think about and make sure that, that uh, the version of NPM itself is, is locked. This, the same is true for Node. Uh, for browsers you test against, anything that has a version number should be specified in your source control repository inside of an install script to set up your local or CI environment or configuration script, whatever you're using. And lastly, if you are really um, feeling strongly about making control, um, having control over all of the variables, you should consider using VM images, either for CI or even for local development. Then uh, we'll give a presentation on Docker, which is one of the ways how you can achieve this. The next area th from, uh, through which we receive variables and we, we should use to control variables is a build process. Ensuring that the way we build uh, a software locally and on CI is the same, is one way to achieve that. But this is often difficult using the tools that we have today um, because things take too long. It's okay if it takes too long on the CI, we, and that can run. But we don't have the patience to wait 10, 15 minutes to install everything and build everything locally every time we want to iterate. This is why we take shortcuts, and this is why we often introduce errors into our engineering process. One way how we solve this uh, at Google is using this tool called Bazel. Uh, Alex Eagle is going to give a presentation about this build tool that claims to be both fast and correct um, and allows you to not take these shortcuts and, and, be, and, and, and culture fewer surprises during the engineering process. So check out his presentation to see if this is something that you would want to use. And lastly, network, which is especially important for bigger enterprises. <laughs> I strongly suggest that you avoid installing stuff from internet because it's, it's a resource that you don't control and you don't control the downtime. Resources can change on the internet. So for bigger enterprises, I suggest that you use um, local proxies uh, for either NPM or any kind of other dependencies so that you have um, the peace of mind, that, peace of mind that, that whatever you install is something that comes from, from the sources that you, you control. When we take a, the last, uh, we take a look at the last scenario, um, which is, it worked just fine yesterday. We made a bunch of changes. Now it doesn't work. We don't understand why. The best way to do that is to, to, to avoid this problem is making small incremental changes with tests, of course, and integrate them. Um, when the changes are small, changes few files um, and well documented, and we have a reproducible build setup then it's very easy for us to review this change, uh, to review these changes, um, identify any kind of culprits uh, when things suddenly stop working in the future, and also roll back these changes and fix them. So having good, clean history in the source control repo repository is a big way uh, and a big win to, to uh, counter this kind of problems. Let's take a look at the last uh, category, which is about making engineering quantifiable. This is, of course, done through measuring and tracking. Um, and kind of unsurprisingly, what I see as a common mistake is that engineering teams jump to this area uh, of practices and kind of forgo all the previous ones, which I think is a big mistake because if you can't reliably measure uh, things, if you're measuring an application in a broken state, if you cannot attribute the changes you made to the progressions or regressions, then you can't really reliably measure and get all the benefits of from measuring and tracking of whatever it is that you're measuring and tracking. So I strongly suggest that you first master the first two categories before you put a lot of attention and focus on, on the last one, on, on measuring and tracking. There's a lot of th many different things that we can measure and track. Um, we often talk about performance, so let's just uh, scope the, the discussion to that. Um, and when we talk about performance, we often say about how we want things to be fast. Well, that's great, but we often forget to specify what should be fast, how fast is fast enough, and under what conditions. Often when I discuss performance with teams, they don't have any kind of formal or specified goals. They, they don't know um, what, uh, what kind of devices their audience is using. Um, they don't, they don't uh, know what their current state is. Um, and these are all the things that we should understand before we dive into and claim that, oh, we, we have all these metrics and, and we are doing well or not well. So what makes a good goal or a good metric? Um, I think that there should be three criteria that should be fulfilled. The good goal or metric should reflect some kind of business or UX objective. It should be reliably measurable. 
and we should track it over time and understand when there is a regression or progression and act on it. Some of the good examples of metrics that um, we often see um, are specific different scenarios. When we want an application to be at user's fingertips, which means the user often starts the application, does some short transactions, and then leaves, um, the interesting goal is to have good startup time. And the metric for that is time to interactive. Time to interactive is the time it takes for the application to start and become responsible to user input. Another class of metrics um, looks at responsiveness. This is often important for applications where the user sessions are long, where users are performing lots of transactions. And the input, um, we want to be very responsive to the user input. So this is where we measure resp response latency. Um, for Angular applications, it can be how long does it take to navigate from one route to another and fully render the other route. There are many other different scenarios and, and varies based on application. And the last one, if, we, if our goal is to make applications very engaging, um, we should pay attention to smoothness. Smoothness is um, measured in frames per second during scrolling operations, animations, or any kind of user, uh, heavy user actions. Um, and there is a good way to, to measure this. So let's, let's take a look at how, how to measure. Um, before we start measuring, again, I, I um, repeat that, that we should know that what we are measuring is actually working and we can attribute any kind of changes we make and iterations to uh, the, the progressions and regressions that are happening. Um, there are lots of details to keep in mind uh, when we want to assure um, accuracy of, of measurement. And I don't really want to go into all these details um, because it's way better to just use existing tools that were designed and built around all these little details and take care of all, the, all this stuff for you. Uh, some of the popular ones that my team uses is BenchPress. Uh, BenchPress can be used for startup time, uh, measuring startup time, the responsiveness as well as smooth, smoothness. Uh, there's a very popular tool called Lighthouse, which is great for um, testing progressive web applications. And if you are interested in understanding how your application uh, is starting on different mobile devices and different network conditions, uh, webpagetest.org is a great resource where you can go and get a real device and see how your application is rendered. Um, and lastly, it wouldn't really matter if we had all these metrics, if we picked them and started measuring, if we didn't track them. There are many different ways to track metrics. Um, you can use existing monitoring infrastructure for production. You can use existing dashboards. We build our own for, for our benchmarks. Uh, there are also generic tools, like Google Analytics is a great tool to track metrics. Uh, I know it's, it's often not something you would think about, because when we talk about Google Analytics, we think user visits. But it's actually great at tracking anything. You have custom dimensions. You can, you can do quite a lot of stuff, build dashboards uh, off of Google Analytics. Once, once we have all of these things in place, now we can start iterating. Now we can start driving towards the goal. And um, I believe this is how we can be successful uh, at, at engineering or software projects. So I covered quite a lot of ground. Um, we talked about building this invisible, and I talked about the three areas, the ensuring quality uh, through automated testing, making engineering reproducible by controlling variables, and making engineering quantifiable by specifying good goals, picking good metrics, and making sure that we measure them in the right way and track them over time. I know that all of these things, it's a lot of work, and it takes discipline uh, to, to set it all up and make sure that everybody on the team understands the value. But I strongly believe that it takes discipline to build the invisible. And unless we don't do this, then we will keep on being surprised by all kinds of things changing without us knowing or us uh, not being able to achieve the goals that we set, together, so set for our project. That, thank you very much. I left the link. I left the link in the slides.